let's talk about dinosaurs. So we have three fabulous presenters joining us today. The man that probably needs no introduction, artist and paleo nerd extraordinaire, Ray Birthday Boy Troll. And then joining us all the way from Fairbanks, we have the Museum of the North director and paleontologist, Dr. Pat Brokenmiller. And then Southeast Alaska's favorite, mostly retired, I don't know if this looks like retirement, geologist, Jim Bacho. Oh, yeah, Ooh, set the mood. Mood, yeah, mood. Oh, mood good, lighting, that's okay, good. great. <clears throat> well, uh, it's my very great pleasure to be here in Ketchikan. I got away from Fairbanks and it's nice wintry conditions. It was, what, minus 18 this morning there? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, happy to be in Southeast Alaska, a place I love to be. And I'm here to tell you about great things paleontological going on in this amazing state of Alaska. And I'm here to do this, of course, with Ray Troll, who you all know, and uh, geologist extraordinaire, Jim Bachtel. We have, three of us have had various adventures together through our careers. So we're gonna take you on a very eclectic tour through some of the things we think are really cool that uh, go back all the way to ancient sharks in southeast Alaska, to uh, strange marine reptiles from uh, very near to here, uh, crazy things like dinosaurs in Denali National Park in the North Slope, and eventually coming home all the way to forests with, can you believe it, palm trees here in southeast Alaska. And I believe with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ray. Well, thanks, Pat. And uh, I just got to say that uh, you know, thank you for coming out today and coming to the, the exhibit last night. And I've learned so much from these guys. And uh, this is one of my favorite moments from 2004. I almost wonder if I need that. See if the long feedback. There, is that all right? I guess. But uh, in 2004, uh, when this photo was taken, uh, so uh, 20 years ago, and I've known this guy for like 30 years. We just had our uh, our ammo anniversary. That's uh, right. When we found <laughs> an ammonite 30 years ago here in the village of Vito Island. But I, when I first moved to Ketchikan, Alaska, you know, I was a, a paleo there my whole life, but finding out really through Jim's eyes and then eventually meeting Pat, this is really a prehistoric uh, wonderland. You know, I always thought there's no dinosaurs or ichthyosaurs around here, and lo and behold, there are if you go to where the rocks are. And we searched all day for this one site, and this is the exact moment when Jim turned around to me. We were looking for Paleozoic sharks over on Sumez Island, and we found the spot. We turned and said, "Bingo! Here they are!" And there they are, shark teeth. So I was like, "Wow!" When um, when you look at a state the size of Alaska, and people say, <clears throat> "How the heck do you know where to dig for dinosaurs?" You know, it's, it's such a vast area. Where do you begin figuring out where to look for, for fossils of anything? And the answer is, look at the rocks. The geologists uh, who have made careers trying to map the rocks of this state have provided us with a tremendous gift as paleontologists, and that is we know how old the rocks are, and we know what kind of rocks we have. And on this map is a, um, a green color. You can see it's marked with an M. Everywhere you see M, that's Mesozoic, which you now all know is the age of dinosaurs. And if it's sedimentary, sedimentary, my dear Watson, that would be rocks like sandstones and shales and mudstone. That's where you find fossils. So I look at a map like this and I go, if it's Mesozoic, if it's sedimentary, I might find dinosaurs. And then you just have to go into the field and start looking. And voila, it's in these places where we actually find many of these fossils. So now you understand from the geology that a lot of those dots land on the green M. And in Southeast Alaska, it's really complicated. And that's because there's a lot going on in this part of the world. And I'm gonna let Jim talk a little bit about that. So Pat was giving you an idea of where to look. The thing you need to also know is the history of those rocks and the packages of those rocks that share the same history. And those are called terrains. And uh, I, I remember right, bits and pieces of 
terrain scattered throughout the South Deep or all of Alaska. There's like 130 bits and pieces of continent that's been crashed on and added on to this thing that we know that's Alaska that's been folded and folded and fractured and moved across that landscape. So it makes it really complex. But if you're looking for Mesozoic dinosaurs, you have to know what terrain it's in or work. Were those deposited here in what was originally Alaska or were they added on? Did they come in from someplace else? In Southeast Alaska, we've got six or seven different terrains that's added on. Um, we're sitting right now on the edge of the Alexander terrain, but you go a little bit inland here on the island and you're in the Yukon Canada terrain. And, and the rocks here around Ketchikan maybe once held fossils, but they've been buried and heat and temperatures have changed those rocks and metamorphosed those rocks. And so now it's not too probable that you're going to find things in the zone here. However, the history of the rocks on Garvina is slightly different. And so if you zoom in to that, you can kind of see the Alexander terrain is the AX and Yukon Canada is Y2. And so we, are, we kind of take a look at that. That package of rocks has a similar history in how it got here to, to Southeast Alaska. And then when we're looking for marine reptiles, we have to find those Triassic marine sediments where they exist in that terrain. And hopefully those sediments weren't heated and recrystalled to a crystallized to a point that those fossils were destroyed by that process. So we start by looking for where the highest probability is with the right age of rocks and the environment that that would have been laid out. If you're looking for marine reptiles, you need to have marine sediments that haven't been so disturbed by the process of bringing these terrains in and burying them that they've been changed. And Ray has easily captured the whole concept <laughs> of the terrain wreck. The terrain wreck. And that's not too far from the reality when you get out there. The other problem, the interesting thing is, of course, we've got all this green vegetation that's all been glaciated and buried and stuff. And one of the things that when we're mapping geology is if we get two or three good outcrops per square mile, it's a wonderful thing. And everything, we, the story we tell in between is kind of geofantasy because you've got to make it up. We're not in the desert southwest where you can walk the edge of outcrops. And so you take the complexity of this plus the terrain that we have and all of our shorelines and how hard it is to get around and it's really difficult to do that geologic mapping. Back. Oh, these are your guys. Let's, uh, let's start a little tour of critters and talk about some of the animals that uh, have a particularly interesting fossil record in Alaska. Um, one of the, uh, and actually I'll have to do the next one too, uh, there are a lot of different animals that lived during the Mesozoic, the age of dinosaurs, that lived in the ocean, that we just generally call marine reptiles. These are not dinosaurs. Dinosaurs never took to the ocean. But there's a whole bunch of other weird reptilian groups you may or may not have heard of that lived in the oceans at the same time dinosaurs were tromping around on land. And two of particular relevance to Alaska are ichthyosaurs and thalatosaurs. Uh, we have fossils here in southeast Alaska of both, in fact, some fantastic material from this part of the world. First group I'm going to tell you a bit is a quick introduction to this strange group called Philatosaurs. And Philatosaur literally just means sea reptile. Isn't that original? Yeah. Um, this is a group of animals that was exclusively marine. They only lived, as far as we know, in the ocean. And um, they're kind of a funny little group because you could kind of imagine these as sort of lizard-like animals. Most of them were less than 10, 15 feet long at the most. They weren't very big. They're not very well known or studied. But you find them in places like the mountains of Italy, uh, parts of southwest China, and then western North America, including southeast Alaska. And they have these crazy skulls. Some of them have teeth. Some don't have teeth. Some have a downturned snout. Some have a straight snout. I mean, it's just a bizarre little group. And there's like, I don't know, seven people in the world who study these things. And I guess I'm one of them now. <laughs> this is a little reconstruction of one fancifully crawling out on land, which probably didn't happen. But um, here's the neat thing about thalatosaurs. They actually showed up during that one window of time in the Mesozoic we call the Triassic. 
And you might have heard about a gargantuan, biggest mother of extinctions that ever occurred on planet Earth. It occurred right here at the very end of the Paleozoic, in the, or in other words, at the start of the Mesozoic. It killed off something like 90% of marine life on planet Earth. It was a really bad time. And as a result, new things came in after this extinction event during the Triassic period. Some other things you might have heard of that first showed up in the Triassic. Um, let's see, mammals, um, dinosaurs, uh, let's see, crocodilians, uh, turtles, they all showed up in the Triassic. It's a really cool window of time. Thalatosaurs. Um, oh, and th the other thing about the Triassic that's interesting is it's bounded by another one of these mega extinctions in the Earth's history. So it's a really fascinating period. Thalatosaurs are actually um, showed up very early in the Triassic, ended up living only in the Triassic. 40 million years may not may sound like a lot of time, but geologically speaking, it was, it was pretty quick compared to dinosaurs that stuck around for 160 million years during the Mesozoic. And um, we have an amazing thalatosaur story right here in Southeast that Jim's going to tell you about. So one of our first fossil things that Ray and I did was to recover an ichthyosaur off of the corner of Bivalver Bay over on Gravina Island. And soon after that, there was a report came out that there was a bone bed found up by Cape. And they published a picture in the bag in the very front of the Ketchikan Daily News, but the people that found it wouldn't tell me where it was at. They were very hush hush about that. And I was boating down through the Kiku Islands, and I remembered seeing the log on the beach that was published on the front page of the Catch Can Daily News. I, I'm not making this up. I pulled in and walked up, and here's all these bone beds. It was amazing. There wasn't one. There was actually ended up being 18 different bone beds. So we sponsored a research student to come in in 2005. It was, and we did, he published his master's thesis on that, and we, but we love this place as a camping spot. So in 2011, we went back and it was a negative 4.1 tide. Really rare up in the Petersburg area up in there, big, big tides. And there's some incredible marine life right down here. So I got up at four o'clock in the morning, made coffee and got everybody out of bed and said, you gotta come down and look at this really cool. There's brachiopods and all this stuff. And we were walking back um, on May 18th in uh, 2011, we're walking back, and I was on that upper terrace, and Gene was down below, and he goes, hey, Jim, what is this? <laughs> and what he Famous. saw was the tail section of what we did find out to be a thalatosaur. That was the first morning that I ever took a cell phone. I had a flip phone. I had never taken a picture of it, and I had cell service, and I sent it to Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I didn't know what it was. I knew it wasn't an ichthyosaur because it had processes coming off the vertebrae, but beyond that, I was lost. So I got a hold of Pat, and we had one month from this day, we had another day four tide. So twice in the year, this fossil would ever be exposed, and it's actually at about a day two foot tide where it was at. So we had a really narrow window to get it out of the rock. And we amassed a large group of folks. Uh, this is what we saw. This is what we first saw when we came out. And so you've got the portion of the tail coming out there. Uh, it, up would be this way. So it's, it, the tail is laying flat, the bottom of the tail going down, and a little bit of the leg bone coming out at the top. Pat talked about where in the world thalatosaurs are found today. And if you reconstruct the Triassic world at that time, about 220 million years ago, this is where most of the thalatosaurs that are found today were at near, near the equator or up to 20 degrees north, and ours next week was coming in. It was living on an island that would be part of a terrain that eventually crashed into southeast Alaska. And uh, if you think about the probability of finding this thing, you think about the probability of anything out there being surviving, not being preyed upon, being buried rapidly in the sediment, decomposing so it's completely articulated, floating halfway around the world to crash into southeast Alaska, and then we actually stumbled onto it. We should have all went and bought lottery tickets. Uh, anyhow, 
this is kind of, so they're, they're sub-equatorial and spread completely across what then was the uh, continents at that time of the trial. And so Pat came down in June uh, following this and we put a huge effort in because so we used concrete cutoff saws to remove the rock and to remove two great big panels that came out of this. And then we, uh, we took out the first panel and we could see bone going into the second panel. And we knew from the stuff in China that some of this stuff was two meters in length. And so we went way back into the hill and took a gigantic slab out for the second. And then there was no more bone shown in the second. So we got this out, the tide came in, and then for the rest of the year this was totally uh, covered by salt water. And we put it back in the boat, brought it back to Thorn Bay, I put it into a box and sent it up to Pat. And that was in my garage when I put the box together and mailed that out to Fairfax. to talk about it. Sure, yeah. <clears throat> so when this arrived, of course, this is, you know, this is, the nice thing about my job is any day can potentially be Christmas. And that's really uh, the case when, especially I get a call from like Jim, all excited about something. Look what we found. And then someday it actually arrives at your doorstep and we have a lab up there where we can actually do what we call fossil preparation. We can clean the rock off the bone and see what we have. And remember at this point, we really didn't know what we had. We had some little tail vertebrae sticking out and something we could kind of see in cross section in two gargantuan blocks of rock. So I realized this was gonna be delicate work. So I, I actually gave a call to uh, my friend, colleague, uh, J.P. Cavagelli here, who uh, is from the Tate Museum in Casper, Wyoming. I said, J.P., how'd you like an all expense paid trip to Fairbanks in the middle of winter? <laughs> and not only did he say yes, but he said yes three times, because I brought him up three times, two weeks apiece, to have him work on this fossil. And the first thing, um, the next thing uh, I said, well, let's have you start with the spot that we could see that was sort of between those two blocks of rocks. We could see bones sticking out. Let's start there. And he did. And he began preparing. And uh, you can kind of see, oh yeah, there we go. So this is the block. So this is the first block. And here's the second block. And this is the little spot in between we could see in cross section that had bone. So he started preparing that. And this, whatever, 250 pound block of rock actually had about one and a half inches of the snout of this little amazing animal. And when JP uncovered that, I saw that and I said, there is no animal on planet Earth that looks like this that's ever been described before. This is bizarre, bizarre, crazy. And so he continued basically preparing um, the rest of the slab. He started to uncover the limb bones. Um, and he discovered more and more of the skull and every day I'd come up in the lab and look and be like, oh my gosh, this is getting crazy. And eventually uh, he worked his way sort of from the rear end forward and the head end back. And eventually we ended up with this absolutely spectacular skeleton that includes the skull. Here's the torso and ribs. There's a bunch of hair like little bones in the belly region here called gastralia. Um, this is the base of the tail. Here's the hind limb. Here's a forelimb. And we're missing, we're actually missing about three quarters of the tail. So the tail is half the length of the animal. And what we ended up with is not only what could we say for sure this is a thalatosaur, but this is a new species of thalatosaur, absolutely without a doubt. And it's the most complete kind of thalatosaur ever found in North America. And just a couple of quick highlights. Uh, the skull, as you can see, is beautifully preserved. The first thing that really was crazy was look at how pointy that snout is. It's extremely sharp. And when I looked at other thalatosaurs, some of them had sort of pointy snouts, but nothing like this. This was very, very different. Um, another really interesting thing, so just to orient you, here's the, the nose opening, here's the eye opening right here. This is sort of the top of the head. Here's the lower jaw. And uh, the very end of the lower jaw had no teeth. That was also really bizarre. And when you look at those teeth, um, the teeth, uh, so there's the teeth. So look at, that's one millimeter scale. These are not big teeth, okay? This is a very, very, just tiny little teeth, but a whole row of very sharp, pointy, kind of recurved teeth. And though we also found 
we started to get into a lot of gory details of this, the anatomy, which I won't trouble you with here, but uh, one of the things we noticed was that there was some features uh, in the throat region, some bones that we usually never find as fossils. Those bones are associated with two things. Um, they're associated with a really strong tongue musculature in animals that tend to be suction feeders. And at the end of the day, what we were able to sort of interpret about this animal is that the kind of a living analog for some of the behaviors might be something like a moray eel. And moray eels actually have bizarre little ways of extending their jaws and capturing prey. They also have kind of pointy snouts, not like, not like our thalatosaur friend necessarily. Uh, but what we envisioned for this thalatosaur was it lived in a coral reef environment. And we think it was using that pointy snout to kind of probe into in between the little interstices of the rocks to find little soft invertebrate prey and kind of go suck them out and grab them, pull them into their mouth and grab them with those little teeth and then whoop, swallow them down. Really cool that not only could we say this is a new species, but it's also uh, got this unique feeding behavior, which we'd never documented in this group before. Uh, one little comment about uh, food, by the way, is it also has something called a bromolite. It's got gut contents. There's a little big, well, it's a little poopy pile. I guess that's the way I call it. A little poopy pile right there in the back of the rib cage. This is food that was partially digested that it never passed about the time that it died. And that's also a very rare thing to find. When we were done, we ended up with a new species of Thalatosaur, and that means we write a paper and we present a new scientific name uh, to the world for this species. So we have two parts, the genus part and the species ending. And I'm gonna let Ray talk about this because he provided a really, really cool little part of the story for the name. Thanks, I, I'm in that little group of, uh, I think, eight people that really care about thalatosaurus. <laughs> so I was in on this conversation all along, so it was really fun. But I got to be the guy to do the drawing, one of the first drawings of this animal in life, and that was just so exciting for me. And, you know, I mean, I've been drawing dinosaurs my whole life, and to be part of uh, this discovery and uh, to actually get to do this uh, for the scientific paper that came out. Pat sent me photographs and then actually uh, 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 molded the, of the uh, actual fossil itself. But uh, since uh, I've been here in Ketchikan for 40 years and have been around the Clinton Highland and Simshan people, and I knew that this was discovered not far from the village of Cake, I thought it should have the, uh, I suggested that we give it a Clinton name. And I knew about Kinnika Day being a sea monster. So I thought that uh, it should be given a, a Clinket name, and uh, I suggested these to uh, Pat and Jim that be, uh, be done, and they liked the idea, so I approached Rosita World, Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation. She said she'd talk to the proper people because this is an important uh, crest animal, and so many plants all throughout Southeast. And I think three months later, she said, yes, everybody's really excited about this, go for it. But I think it was about, Two years later, he finally did the paper, right, or something like that. It's, right. it's, a, it's a slow but, process. But anyways, it's, I think the first time that a Clinket name has uh, been used as a scientific name, so it's really cool to be part of that story. Back to you. Okay. Yeah. Right, you to you can, don't you? Now we're going to move to your backyard over here. 2004, I got involved with a group of folks working on some of the coral deposits over at Messina Bay and the Henta Bay and up along the coastline and uh, Bostwick of the backside of Gravina Island. And uh, I didn't know nothing about bones. I hadn't seen any of these bones in the rock yet, so I didn't have a search image. 2005, I worked outside of Cape on that deposit, cut out hundreds and hundreds of bones, and then we worked on the Salatosaur and visited a bunch of these things, and I'm like, you know what, I saw some of this stuff. Not knowing what it was on the backside of Gravina, when I was down there, we've got to go back. So Pat and, and uh, Ray and a uh, gentleman named Kevin and I went out to Cena Bay and stayed in the Forest Service cabin and worked on these rocks throughout up and down the coastline. So in 2003, we had 2003, we had rediscovered 
a small ichthyosaur, like I talked about up by Balder Bay. But there was other ichthyosaurs in the sea because after the stuff we'd done at the same place we found the Salatosaur, we found these huge vertebrae from what's known as a Shotosaur. So we knew we had these giant whale-sized ichthyosaurs and we had these small ichthyosaurs and there was many other bones we found, salatosaurs, so it was a, a lot of different marine reptiles in that Triassic Sea. And their function is very similar to what we have with dolphins today. All right. So we go out to the backside in the Hinta Bay and sadly, if you've ever been in there, those rocks are vertically dipping. So you don't get to see a nice flat bedding plane like the Thalatosaur is, you're looking at the end of that. And I was walking along and I looked down and saw that. And there was all kinds of hoops and hollers out there on the beach. Because this was a really, really large round bone, a rib bone out of a very large ichthyosaur. And actually, it ended up being 14 different bones. It was kind of like a baby back ribs kind of pushed down into the rock down there. A uh, very, very large animal. But sadly, again, this thing was dipping straight down. So I found somebody that really wanted to have some hard work and drive a lot of chisels and pack large rocks. And so Judd and Chris, uh, Tina and I went out there and started working our way down. And of course, this thing's in a tide, and you've got to play the tides, and, and you know, so the site will get flooded out, so we had a very short working time. Anyhow, in a couple of days, we were able to take that block down to a rock that we thought we could pick up size, <laughs> because we had to carry it back over to the boat. So we eventually dried this out and took it up to Fairbanks, where JP was in the back room working on the flood. We also started referring to him as JP and the Philatosaur. It's kind of a nice band name. He's got a name to it. I like that. Yeah, but anyhow, he gave me a lot of uh, things <laughs> and, and, and gave me the tools, and I got to start working on this. This is fun stuff when you're sitting there taking this thing right now. Anyhow, I got to prep this fossil. And this is kind of going through the steps. So when we ended up, we ended up with this great big pile of ribs. So you got to know there was the ribs that were exposed right up at the top up there. That's what was sticking out of the rocks when I found it. And that was as big a piece of rock as we could pick up. But the ribs are still going down in the ground. The problem is to get any more of this fossil out, you'd have to excavate a hole the size of the front of this auditorium. So at the, because of the vertical nature of the rocks, it really limited what we could take out. Pat, you want to talk about this? Sure. This is your this your little bowl. Yeah. This is what I got really excited when I really <laughs> when I realized because of his experience how big this thing from Gravina was that we'd found. And, and it's hard to get Jim excited about stuff. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so I I was uh, we Jim was working away on this and we started to look at um, the size of those ribs. You know, ribs are really kind of good general indicators of body size. And I just so happened to had, uh, back in my grad student days, helped excavate the largest ichthyosaur that had ever been excavated on planet Earth, a 70, 75 foot long monster of Shonosaurus from British Columbia with my former graduate advisor um, at the R Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology. And, um, uh, we were, you know, uh, we were working away on that skeleton years ago, and uh, there's a couple of little leftover bones from the excavation, and one of them was just a fragment of rib that I remember keeping for my teaching collection, uh, with with permission, and I had that, and I thought, wait a minute, I mean, there's an animal we know how big that animal is because we excavated the whole thing, and it's over 70 feet long. And I ran it down into my teaching collection. I grabbed it, I brought it upstairs, and I said, Jim, check this out. And I put it there next to the diameter of some of these other ribs that came from Gravina Island. They're basically the same size. 70 feet. 70 wow. feet. So think about that, the size of an animal. Um, so here, by the way, is part of that skeleton of that ichthyosaur uh, that was collected in British Columbia. This skull, by the way, that's only half of the skull. And it took us one summer to do the skull. The skull is, is around 15 feet long, the skull. And the rest of the body, as I said, about 70, 75. This is kind of a reconstruction of its size. Now think about the ribs. And when you think about how big that animal is, it may be better if we think about it in terms of 
modern animals of comparable size like fin whales and blue whales, the largest creatures to ever live on planet Earth. So that's the size of the animal swimming around here in southeast during the Triassic. And it's pretty mind-blowing. It's pretty impressive. I just want to toss one thing in there, as usual, but I, they can hear me. Okay. I was walking, I was with Jim and you that day when Jim was hunting, we were hunting for ichthyosaurs at Ravina Island. And I think, as usual, I was about five paces behind you. We'd gone back and forth, and there was just this small little black thing. He said, there it is. I remember that. <laughs> Not easy to spot a 70-foot, uh, you know, ichthyosaurus. <laughs> just got a grip sticker there. Uh, just yeah, just the I'd like to point out, too, we don't have these dinosaur stuff that he's going to talk about in southeast Alaska, but we've got some really cool marine reptiles. Yeah. yeah. So we've got to be proud of that. This is our backyard. Yeah, it's really <laughs> impressive. When are we going to excavate this thing? Huh? When are we going to excavate this thing? <laughs> I don't know. Well, first off, I probably created a tide pool out there. By now, there's like... 400 limpets living in that pool. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> Ray, any comments on your? Uh, so after this discovery, I was so excited. I was working on the book, uh, the Fossil Coastline book. I just sat down. I had to draw all these animals, and I wanted to have them in the book. So there's the giant shonosaurus, and there's the, uh, well, the two of these saurs from Ravina Island. And at the time, uh, Gilly Kadek did not have a name, so it just Flatosaur. There's also been shark bits and stuff, but this is stuff from our neighborhood, and uh, really super cool. Yeah, very cool. There's no cheeseburger. In there. There's no cheeseburger. There's no cheeseburgers. Oh, yeah. oh yes. I think. <laughs> well, I spent about a, almost um, eight months or more just drawing through the pen and ink of this big fossil map for the fossil coastline book, and. Then I took it to Frontier Shipping and actually cut the drawing in half. It kind of hurt when I did that because I had to get it through the scanner in Frontier Shipping. So we scanned it, cleaned it up, and then handed it over to Grace Freeman, right over there. And she spent many months coloring this, and uh, this is our giant fossil map of Alaska. And everything up there represents a fossil find. So. And, and I love always this, when I'm giving talks on whatever kind of fossils, I usually like to start with this because it shows the diversity of life that called Alaska home at some point in time in our geological history. And, and actually, uh, oftentimes I use it to highlight some of the important Mesozoic fossil sites uh, for things like dinosaurs and all the way up on the North Slope. And so actually now I'd like to turn your attention to dinosaurs from the North Slope and we're gonna leave Southeast you're going to take a, a very long flight up to northern Alaska and talk a little bit about Arctic dinosaurs.